Hello everyone, and welcome to a very special episode of The Feels. My sponsor this episode is Vibe Cannabis. Vibe Cannabis is proud to be Missouri owned. They operate right here in downtown St. Louis. Vibe Cannabis specializes in cultivating and manufacturing high-end flour, pre-rolls, and live rosin carts and concentrates. Vibe is freshness. They're the only cultivator in Missouri to nitrogen seal their flour. Opening an eighth of Vibe Cannabis is like pulling fresh flour from their cure room. In just five months, Vibe has already been nominated for Best Cultivator, Strain of the Year, Concentrate of the Year, and Startup of the Year by Greenway Magazine. And you know what? They were named Startup of the Year. You'll always have good vibes with Vibe Cannabis. My guest today is the president of the Tricome Institute in Denver, Colorado, Mr. Max Montrose. This episode was pre-recorded. Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Feels from a Distance. My guest today is a passionate cannabis and entheogen instructor through his company, Tricome Institute. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Max Montrose. Max, thank you so much for being a guest on From a Distance. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Now, I'd like to start off, what precisely is an entheogen? Uh, what is an entheogen? Entheogen. An entheogen... Um, is a sacred plant medicine. And so um, these are substances that are not just psychedelic substances. They are ones that have been revered religiously for spiritual purposes from particular groups or cultures and generally for millennia. Um, and so sacred plant medicines um, that really achieve the goal of helping you better understand yourself, the world, the universe, um, God. And cannabis is one of these medicines? Oh, absolutely. Yes, cannabis is definitely an entheogen. Um, people from around the world have been spiritually and religiously using cannabis um, in dozens of cultures. So uh, cannabis is absolutely an entheogen. Now, for your business, Tricome Institute, why focus on trichomes? Um, the, the name Tricome Institute wasn't because of a focus on trichomes. It was my way of trying to name my company something about cannabis that wasn't something canna or ganja or, or, or weed. It's like, well we do really high level pinpointed and sophistic, you know, sophisticated cannabis education and information. So what part of the plant is the most important? What part of the plant is that little pinpoint that means the most, the way that I would want my company to represent that. And mm -hmm. of course that would definitely be the plants trichomes. Now, um, since then though, I didn't expect that observing thousands and thousands of samples of cannabis uh, microscopically for lots of other work that we do with the plant that I would have observed um, multiple sets of glandular trichome types that are not found anywhere in any scientific literature pertaining to cannabis. Um, and so I have been on a mission for nearly eight years now uh, to prove that those trichomes are novel scientifically. And um, thus far, um, we have a partnership with Texas A&M University to do that research. And just literally five minutes before I got on this, uh, this show with you, I was just reviewing some of the scanning electron microscopy images of those trichome types as we're uh, organizing them and beginning to define them as we're analyzing um, if indeed they are novel and uh and how you would prove that which is pretty interesting stuff yeah. okay um what is going to take up more space inside of a trichome a terpene or cannabinoid um that's a good question um and i think to make this even more complicated i guess the question is based on the variety of cannabis that you'd be analyzing at the time and based off of its genealogy, uh, its growth pattern, and whatever it's been hybridized with would determine how much of what chemistry it has in it. 
And so, you know, um, your hemp varietals won't have THC in them, but they'll be loaded with terpenes. But does that mean cannabinoids versus terpenes? It's like, well, if you're only analyzing CBD, then you don't know how many other cannabinoids are in there if you're not looking at the other 150 known cannabinoids that could be in there. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, just for example's sake, when people lab test for terpenes, they generally only lab test for six terpenes, 12, 24, and commercially, the highest amount is really 42 terpene types. Well, that's cool, except there's over 200 terpenes in each sample of cannabis or up to. Mm -hmm. And if you're not looking for those terpenes, you won't know how much of the volume of those terpenes are in there, let alone the other 200 psychoactive aromatic uh, chemicals, uh, which would include all of your thiols. Thiols are sulfuric. The can of sulfur compound is what's responsible for the smell of skunk. That is those not a newly theory. discovered, right? I'm sorry correct. to interrupt, but those were newly yeah. discovered, correct? Yes, yes. And that's from another uh, friend of mine, Abstract Labs. So Abstracts, um, they built a, a homemade, they made it themselves, um, a, a cannabis aromatic supercomputer. And they use three-dimensional gas chromatography to see uh, upwards of 400 individual aromatic compounds in a single sample of cannabis. Mm. I mean, so the, the, the idea is we, we literally haven't begun scratching the surface yet when it comes to this plant. There is way too much research to be done. So to answer your question, is there more terpenes or cannabinoids in those gland heads? Man, um, I don't think we, I don't even, I'm not even sure who would know that at this point. <laughs> well, okay. At, um, at the dispensary I work in Florissant, Missouri, Field State, we have sniffer jars. Mm -hmm. But before I open them, I tell a patient to close their eyes clear their nostrils, and then I let them know about the old bud tender's wives' tale that the farther up your nostrils the scent settles, the more uplifting it could potentially be. The lower down your nostrils it settles, the more, particular, the more potentially relaxing it can be. Is that a very simplistic take on interpeening? Yes. <laughs> that is the best. Yes. Uh, that, is, that is the most uh, that is the most concrete and simple way, um, you could, you could go about that. Um, and, and to, uh, I'll, I'll use the weed wheel, uh, in, in describing this to you. So none of these plants are indica or sativa. They are all a hybrid, a domesticated hybridized plant type that's somewhere on a massive spectrum between stimulating and sedative plant types. And the, the difference between whether the plant's gonna be stimulating or sedative, sedative is not cannabinoid dependent. It is aroma dependent. It's the aromatic compounds that are going to dictate that type of psychopharmacy. And um, uh, so as you pointed out, it is, there's a consistency when we talk about a narrow leaf marijuana type, right? We're not talking about hemp. Mm -hmm. We are talking about cannabis. So when you have a narrow leaf type, it's interesting that the inflorescence of the flower um, is more elongated, it's more wispy, but you will smell certain smell types like grapefruit, tangerines, diesels, solvents, and when you not smell them, but where you feel them in mm -hmm. your face is actually the trigeminal nerve of the human body, which is not your sense of smell, sensing the sense of sensation. And so when you get into a hot tub that has way too much chlorine in it, you can smell the chlorine. Mm -hmm. And separately from smelling it, you can actually feel the chlorine vibrating a part of your sensation. Uh, that, so that is that the stimulation of the CB2 receptors on the nerve in that, what was the nerve you said? The, um, it's the trigeminal nerve. Trigeminal, and is that what that is? 
Yeah, it, this has nothing to do with CB1 or CB2 receptors. Right? Okay. So these are not your cannabinoid receptors, and we're not receiving cannabinoids because you can't smell cannabinoids. True. Um, what you are, what we're receiving is we're getting, and this is why it's an interpretation. It's interpreting terpenes, not by just smelling them, but interpreting where in the trigeminal nerve they're being sensed. And so when it comes to like string theory, right? These like vibrating molecules at the, at the smallest essence, Mm -hmm. What you have to understand is these aroma compounds are vibrating. They are in a state of vibration until they dissipate, uh, evaporate, or completely break down. And what the trigeminal nerve of the human face seems to be able to do is sense whether they're vibrating in a stimulating way or they're vibrating in a lower tone, which generally translates to when you consume it, uh, a, a sedative effect type. And the thing is, is when you just take away all the jargon and just show this to somebody, it's mind blowing that you can take a big, chunky, dark nug from a broad leaf type and you can let someone smell it. And if they're paying attention, it is a trip to only smell it here. Mm -hmm. And then I can show you a really diesel-y, um, citrusy uh narrow leaf type which would be really stimulating and it just buzzes and you can only feel it way up here not down here at all well one of my favorite terpenes is beta caryophylline because of its ability in me to take care of pain and inflammation but beta caryophylline is also the only terpene that interacts directly with the cb2 receptor i know you said terps don't interact with the endocannabinoid system. Does that make beta caryophylline a uh, cannabinoid? Well, this is where things get crazy tricky, you know? So first of all, what I said was, we're just scratching the surface with what we know. And so far, beta caryophylline is the only terpene that we've seen have a direct effect with cannabinoids what it appears to be able to do is make the longevity of CBD specifically uh, double the length of time in the receptor. Mm -hmm. So if you have CBD and you mix that with beta caryophylline, it seems like whatever amount of CBD you'd be ingesting would either be twice as potent or would be active for twice as long due to the beta caryophylline mm -hmm. that is interacting with the cb1 cb2 receptor somehow in some way <clears throat> well let's pivot to something a little less mind-blowing uh let's pivot to education okay i'm a graduate of the cannabis science and operations program at st louis university that is a 40-week program with a capstone and the information that I learned was reviewed and approved by Missouri industry professionals. I was taught by Missouri industry professionals. When I got hired, I went through Emma Chasen's eminent consulting training. So I feel like I have a really good background and can be a very effective bud tender. But so many people do not get the kind of training that I got. What is traditionally missing from bud tender training programs? That's a good question. Um, you know, I've been in cannabis education for a decade. Um, and I come from Denver, Colorado, where we kind of started this whole thing. And the thing that always, always, always shocked me was the majority of, let's just call them bud tender education courses that were available you know, 10 years ago, even up to about really five or six years ago, really um, reiterated the misinformation about cannabis uh, tenfold. I mean, all of those classes were teaching people that sativa was the one that's a stimulant and indica is the sedative and that's it. And there's, all, and there's those two plant types. They would talk about edibles and, and, and why, 
you might need to be a little bit more cautious, but they wouldn't explain what's happening. They wouldn't explain that there's a, a conversion in the cannabinoid and it's producing a different molecular substance and how and why you need to better understand that for a variety of different people, including people who uh, can never perceive 11-hydroxy-THC based on their body type. I mean, they just talked about brownies. <laughs> like it's pretty, right? And so um, there is a lot of people who have gotten, who have paid for training and education that are bud tender certified in probably hundreds of different courses and programs around the world that simply reiterated misinformation. Um, that's the majority of cannabis education today, in fact, which is why it's so critical to know who you're learning from. Um, on the other side of the spectrum, I've seen the highest level institutions, and I'm not going to name any names, but we're talking some of the most famous education bodies out there that have educators that aren't involved with cannabis that scour the internet for their information to reorganize it. And they don't even understand that they're perpetuating misinformation because they are talking about a highly complex topic that has more misinformation out there about it um, than what's currently being worked on and, and researched, like the stuff we're doing at Texas A&M right now. Um, and so I, I've even seen incredible institutional bodies produce information around cannabis that couldn't be further from the truth. Um, and so it's, it's complicated out there. I'll, I'll well, say this. The biggest misconception is the indica sativa hybrid paradigm that everyone seems to give to everybody else. How, how well, do not we- only that, not only worse than that is the idea that THC somehow is the equation of potency. I mean, yeah, I, like, I always use the analogy. It's not George Clooney. It's Ocean's Eleven. There are a lot more can. There are a lot more chemicals in there. But but how do we break that paradigm? Is it cannabinoid and terpene profiles? Is it thinking of it in terms of broadleaf versus narrowleaf? How how do we break this? Well, there's there's a few different things there. When you're breaking down the paradigm between broad and narrow, you're only talking about really the difference between the assumed effect types of up and down. That's not potency related. That's effect type. Potency is all of the psychoactive compounds that you're ingesting in the moment and how active they all are and in unison would be the equation of potency. That's why it's so easy to explain how cannabis that has 15% THC can get you twice as high as cannabis with 30% THC if the cannabis with 30% THC is older and more dehydrated and has allowed all of its um, aromatic chemistry to evaporate, then what you have left in it is just the psychopharmacy of the THC. When you add the 15% THC to a massive spectrum of dozens and dozens, literally hundreds and hundreds of other highly potent psychoactive molecules, then together and in unison, you have something that is twice as potent as the sample that has twice the amount of THC in it. So what uh, are some of these other potent chemicals then? Dude, we already talked about a couple of them. Uh, thiols, mm -hmm. sulfur compounds. You and me both know that if you smell an herb that is so skunky, it makes your eyes water and you consume that, that something like that could send you to the moon even with 12% THC compared to taking a dab of 99% THC that doesn't have even close to the effect of the flower does, right? Mm -hmm. Who's studying this? Abstract labs. Is this their number one job? No, they have to make money. Most of the science doesn't make money. They have to build products based on you know, like they're, they're a flavor house. They flavor beer, they flavor scratch and sniff stickers. They like, you, you know what I mean? Like they're, they're a flavor house, but they're the only ones who have the machine that could even analyze the amount of chemistry that's even present. That's why they're the guys who came out with the can of sulfur compounds, the six thiols that smell like skunk and are literally one molecular derivative away from what skunks actually produce. 
Um, oh, oh, so we're talking like the difference between lead and gold? You know, one's one molecule away from the other? Kind of, yeah. Yeah, like kind of like how delta-9 THC is a molecule off from 11-hydroxy THC. I mean, they're, I'm they're, so glad. Okay, I'm glad you brought they're pretty, that up. They're pretty damn up. close, but <laughs> damn, you make one little difference and there can be a bit. That's the difference between lead and gold, you know, like that's just I one. I want to pivot to some off. of these new cannabinoids that we're seeing coming out on the market. What's your take of the tsunami of legal THCs extracted from CBD like THCP? THCJD, 11HXY, which I just found out in a newsletter the other day. It's like they're flying the plane before it's been built. It's hard to want to pay attention to that kind of stuff, <laughs> to be honest. Like, um, for me, it's easier to kind of go, la, 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 tell me about it five years from now. Like, Seriously, it, it doesn't concern you, though, that products like this, as soon as they discover a new cannabinoid are being blended with others and rushed to market with zero testing, no certificates of analysis for the patients to look at. All they get on the packaging is indica sativa hybrid. Yeah. Does that concern me? A thousand percent. Does it concern me 10 times more? that we have legislatively mandated lab testing that makes people think that once your flower has been lab tested, it's somehow safe to consume when they don't even look at half of the things that are in the flower to be looked at from a qualitative perspective. I'm, I'm more concerned that we have a multi-billion dollar legal industry around actual cannabis, not doppelganger made up cannabinoids from acid baths and labs from homies who are trying to loophole the system with hep types. That's a thousand miles away from where the multi-billion dollar industry right here, right now, that doesn't even know what cannabis is, that still thinks it's either indica or sativa when it's neither. I mean, you don't even have a single lab test in the country that will test flower and tell a patient this drug is going to be a stimulant or a sedative. It's kind of like going to your pharmacist and getting a bottle of something and not knowing if it's Adderall or Oxycontin. Am I going to want to get up and move around and clean my whole house like, like a, like smoking golden goat, or am I going to take this and not be able to get off the couch? The fact that it is that random, even in, regulated MMJ dispensaries or retail places, the cannabis industry in and of itself is still in a clusterfuck. And it always has been since it came from the black market, which is why research and education is so important. Um, do those things concern me? Yeah, they concern me. Do I have all the time in the world to keep up with it? Keep studying the new one that came out without enough research to actually study it with? No, I don't have time for that. Um, I'm more interested in the, the, the movement of um, sacred plant medicine coming to people in trying to right wrongs of, you know, the war on drugs from the 1970s so people can actually um, heal things that Western medicine can't heal, which is your soul. So your PTSD experience, um, why you are as anxious as you are, why you're the kind of person who used to be able to smoke weed, but now you can't because every time you smoke it, you flip out and, and you can't figure it out. Um, I, I'm way more interested in supporting uh, peyote and San Pedro and DMT and mushrooms than I am in dealing with the circus of homies in their unregulated labs, literally loopholing the system to make a quick buck. That's but doesn't it take problem. away legitimacy from the legitimate industry? Not to belabor no, this point. No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. It doesn't. Because what might be hard for people who aren't in the industry to tell is maybe the difference between actual industry and not. When you're in places that are as adult from a regulatory perspective as the state of Colorado, you're not going to see those 
unknown cannabinoids available for sale because they're not regulated. They're not allowed to be sold in the dispensary. You can't get that stuff there. No, you not have at the to- dispensary, but you can get it at the corner gas station. That's your problem, dude. Is your corner gas station the cannabis industry? No. Are there fake CBD gummy bears a part of our industry? Nope. You're talking about black market loophole gas station corner store bullshit. I don't involve my life with that. I, I got. I guess. I, I guess they look at it in the same way as during prohibition. You might look at bathtub gin being potentially fatal to you versus a regulated product. But I don't want to. I don't want to go go down this rabbit hole any more than we already have. I'll, I'll tell you um, one. I'll tell you one thing about it though. Okay. If I was hanging out with one of my friends who is a scientist that I trust and he had one of these newer cannabinoid types and they were really, um, let's say, psychedelic, the way that cannabis used to be before you developed a tolerance to it and offered me an opportunity to try a new cannabinoid that I haven't tried before that would be a safe and psychedelic experience uh would i try it thousand percent hundred percent am i gonna go to a gas station to buy something like that no all right i've got one more question for you matt uh and it came from one of my fellow employees they wanted to know if terpenes or for that matter cannabinoids can bind to electrolytes the thought being a medicated sports drink um I'm for a, a, for all the scientific jargon I, I spew out, you know, I, I am not a scientist. Like, I, I don't want to say that. Uh, I, yeah, like the, the answer is I don't know um, if they could combine to electrolytes or not, nor do I know if you would even need them to be to combine them with electrolytes. For example, if you had um, cannabinoids that were powdered with an emulsifying agent to make them water soluble. You could take CBD, THC, both, and put a designated and dosed ratio into Gatorade. You could shake that bad boy up and that's all you would have to do to mix it and to make the cannabinoids water soluble. Um, there was a product in Colorado back in the day. I don't know if they still sell it. I live in Oregon now. Um, that was called Ripple. And mm-hmm. they made THC or CBD powdered packets that are water soluble uh, at different doses and ratios. And whether you wanted to make your spaghetti at dinner that evening, 50 milligram CBD, or a cocktail from the bar, 50 milligrams THC infused, you that's all you had to do is just pour this powder in and mix it up. Um, I love the idea of mixing uh, cannabis medicine with uh, sports performance, just based off of how many athletes advocate for it. Mm -hmm. Um, It's pretty hard not to, to pay attention when you hear and see so many weightlifters and runners and Olympians and professional sports people who are like, you know, uh, this stuff is is better than alcohol when I want to, you know, relax and be human with my friends or, um, wow, I get such a good workout when I hit the blunt before I go to the gym. I don't know what it is. I just get in my zone. I hone in. It's like, well, pay attention to that. You know, there's there's enough guys out there, enough girls out there saying it. Um, I, I think it has legs to it. I think it's valuable. Um might be a cool product like some ganja gatorade ganja raid ganja aid cool there, like, there you go i'll 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 be i'll advocate for it bring me down to your dispensary's opening opening day of ganja aid uh give give me five percent of the retail uh, the revenue from, for the idea and we're good uh, <laughs> we'll fly yeah your ticket will be waiting at the airport max <laughs> yeah that sounds fun that sounds really good 
Well, um, that's going to wrap up this episode of the feels from a distance. I really have to thank my guest, Max Montrose. Max, thank you so much. I know you're busy. You took time out. We had a really good conversation. I don't think we blew people's minds completely, but I think they've got a better understanding about terpenes than they had before they started watching the episode. So thank you very much. Yeah. And if people want to learn more, check out our books, our courses, our classes, our science, our research, our tools, trichominstitute.com, uh, social media, trichome.institute. And if you're interested in more psychedelics, uh, that's me on social media, max.montrose. So thanks again, Jeff. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Max. And thank you all out there for watching. Have yourselves a great one. <laughs>